Welcome to HR Voices. A podcast for independent HR and people professionals and the businesses they support. HR Voices is brought to you by the expert team at HR Independence Limited. We hope you enjoy. Welcome to the next edition of the HR Voices podcast. Uh, today, as usual, I'm joined by my colleague, Mary Asante. Hi, Mary. Hi, Charlotte. And we also have um, our guest today, Matt Edge-Wilkins. Hi, Matt. Hi, Charlotte. Hi, Mary. Thanks very much for having me on. You're very Hi. welcome. Hi, everyone. Nice, nice to have you. And uh, Matt's company is called Talent Seeker. And we're following on in terms of recording and how you listen. Obviously, you you might be listening in in different order, but we're following on from a podcast we've already recorded on niching. And this sort of follows on quite nicely because Matt has actually niched in terms of how he provides recruitment services for very specialist roles. And we'll get him to tell you a little bit about that. But we're going to be talking today (laughs) around recruitment and perhaps how recruitment has changed and how the market has changed. Um, But first, let me get Matt to introduce himself because they do a far better job of it than I will. So, Matt, tell us a little bit about yourself and your business. Yeah, thank you, Charlotte. Yeah, so I've been in the world of recruitment for around 20, well, just over 20 years now. Started recruitment actually in Australia randomly because my earlier career was in financial services. Went travelling, very long story, so I'll cut it short, but essentially I got a role in recruitment in Australia while I was there. Got a four-year business visa, uh, did a couple of different recruitment jobs over there. Um, And then when I came back to the UK, I didn't have any desire really to work in a recruitment agency as I had quite kind of negative experiences as a candidate. So I was kind of looking at the different options that were open to me. And I'd always been a very much a people person. So I thought, okay, I'll go down the HR route. So I actually started working as a HR generalist for a local college. My HR manager then at the time trained me on the recruitment side of things for the college and that was it really. Once I started doing the recruitment again I kind of didn't look back. Carried on doing a mixture of recruitment and HR for a few different businesses. The last role I had was a recruitment HR manager for a property investment company which I finished around about nine years ago. Absolutely loved that role but had always kind of wanted to have my own business and a bit more control and and flexibility you know, like other people who launch their own businesses. And I was always much better at recruitment than I was at HR. Always absolutely loved it. So it was just a natural thing for me to sort of start a kind of recruitment and headhunting business, which I did nine years ago. And I wanted to very much kind of deliver an in-house quality service to my clients, but only on an as and when needed basis. So I didn't want to give clients and candidates the same experience that a typical high street recruiter would give. I wanted them to give, have a much more professional, much more personalized service as if I was still an in-house recruiter in a sense, but just recruiting for multiple different businesses. Really interesting. Yeah, because I think, you know, you and I have spoken before uh, in, in other conversations around how the market's changed and how, you know, recruitment can be very impersonal now, can't it? It's, you know, it can be sift and shift by automation and not always hear back. And that's not always the way that we want to bring people into an organisation and engage them and keep them and retain them. I've always sort of say to people that websites like Indeed and Total Jobs and things like that have almost been great and terrible for recruitment at the same time. They're great in the sense, I think from a candidate perspective, in the sense that, you can apply for multiple jobs with a very minimal amount of effort, a few clicks, and you can apply for five jobs by picking up your phone for a few minutes. And I suppose that does certainly give volume of candidates. But I think from a client perspective, what ends up happening is 90%, if not more, of the applications and CVs that you get through are completely irrelevant to the type of candidate profile that they're actually ideally looking for. It's because a lot of people haven't even bothered reading the adverts in full, haven't looked at the person spec. They've just gone off the job title and the salary, clicked apply and just sort of hope for the best. And I think the problem with, you know, where we sort of touched upon about 
candidates being ghosted, companies being ghosted, recruiters being ghosted. A lot of it comes down to that emphasis now on volume as opposed to quality. Um, for example, myself, I, we don't actually advertise jobs. That's one of the things that we don't do because we, we prefer to kind of headhunt because that's how we feel our time's most used in the best way to get the best candidates for our clients. But if I was to put a marketing manager job in London on Indeed today, I'd probably, by the end of play the day, I'd probably have 50 applicants. Within a week, I'd probably have 500 applicants. But the problem is, unless you're going to give that time and effort into every single candidate, you'll spend all your time as a recruiter speaking and, and liaising with candidates that, that aren't suitable for the role. And if you're only getting paid on a contingency basis where you only get paid if you make a placement, you're essentially doing all of that work for free. So I think that's why a lot of a lot of people don't get responses because organisations simply haven't got the manpower or time or inclination to do that, even though in an ideal world they would. I think that you've touched on some really sort of important touch points in the history of recruitment and the evolution of recruitment in the light of technological changes and everything else that comes into place. But I think at the center of it is the two key, I'll say stakeholders, which is the candidate and the organization seeking to recruit. How can we, or how can the recruitment process be improved in a way that makes that experience much more enjoyable and mm. better for both um, two key uh, stakeholders, the candidate and the recruiting manager or the organization? I think it's very hard and it sort of comes down a lot to the individuals involved. As I said, I think the larger big sort of corporate organisations, because they're getting such a high volume of, of applications through, it's very hard to give each of those candidates a really great candidate experience because they they essentially will they'll go into a, a system basically that will constantly be looking to filter them down. So it will filter them down based on their keywords, on their education, et cetera, et cetera. And what they'll what, what those systems will quite often do is they'll have set automated email responses that will go out to each candidate depending on at what point of the process they get through or what point of the process they get out. So I don't think those candidates are ever going to have a great human experience just because of the volume. And I think this is where sometimes smaller businesses who maybe can't compete with those bigger corporates in terms of salaries and benefits packages and things like that, this is where they can have a real edge over the competition because they can give those candidates an amazing candidate experience throughout the journey. So, for example, you might have somebody who is going for the same role in two different businesses if one company shows that they really care about that candidate through the process you know they're keeping in touch regularly they're not dragging out the process over weeks and weeks then they're doing lots of touch points they're making it very personal put through that experience and say that candidate gets offered that job and a, another job where everything has been automated just to give you an example my uh, wife's mum's husband has got two jobs recently where they didn't speak to a person throughout the whole process from the point they applied to the point they started work they never spoke to a human so that's the way it's going so this is what i'm saying so smaller businesses who perhaps can't compete on one side of things one side of the fence if they can give candidates an amazing experience it can sometimes give them an edge in persuading that candidate actually this company is going to treat me a lot better in the long run that is actually very interesting and i i, I think I'm sat here listening to you thinking that is interesting because when you talk about blind recruitment in terms of if you factor in equality or diversity and inclusion and how to actually make your recruitment process more inclusive, I think that probably, yes, some software can be written with sort of prejudice, whatever, embedded in it. but 
if you take all that and we arrive in a situation where that recruitment process is free of bias as best as we can. Mm. Mm. That probably could be the best case scenario for when it comes to blind recruitment, recruitment not having any human involvement at all because then that prejudice kind of it's taken out of the equation altogether. So I think that is actually quite interesting from our point. First time I'm hearing like yeah, and yeah, and with no human involvement. So In, interestingly, and I totally agree from an EDNI perspective and an unconscious or conscious bias perspective. And because what happens as well with a lot of those systems is they'll take out all of the personal information. So there won't even be a name, there won't be anything. So there won't be anything other than that person's um, CV, essentially, or their, their work history. So on one hand, I think that's incredible because it's giving any everybody an equal chance. And actually, a lot of systems are automatically taking that information out before the CVs go in front of the hiring manager. I suppose the counter argument for it is that sometimes a CV doesn't sell somebody very well. So for example, you know, I'll have a, I'll, and this is the advantage sometimes that a candidate doesn't see by going with a, through a, an external recruiter, is that you can add a lot more weight to a candidate's suitability than what's on their CV. You know, I can send a suit, I can send a, a CV to a client, they'll go, they'll look at the CV and go, no, they're not suitable. I'll then phone up the client, and I'll say, or, or I'll have added loads of notes actually. Normally, when I send over, and they'll, and it, it persuade them to get the interview, to give them the interview because I can see that there's things over and above their CV about them as an individual, about their motivations, their values, etc., which doesn't come out in a CV. So it's it, you kind of want somewhere of taking away the bias, but not taking away what makes that person a potentially suitable candidate over and above what's written in black and white. And I think that's the balance. If we can find that balance, then that would be a great place to be. Mm. Uh, it sort of alerted my nosiness, I'm afraid. So you said you said two jobs. You had gone through the automation process for two jobs. So did one not work out? <laughs> yes. Yeah, 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 no. So they were driving jobs. Oh. They were two large supermarkets. <laughs> And the first one, no, the interview process was as it was all automated. The only person he left, the only reason he left one to go to the other was the first one had him driving over a huge region, uh -huh. which was which was making him get back at a ridiculous time in the evening. And the other one was a much smaller region. So in terms of the process, they're identical. Uh -huh. It was just when he came to actually do the job that he realised he didn't want to be spending all of his time in the evenings as well as during the daytimes out driving yeah okay well that's interesting i wonder perhaps if it, it was that the process hadn't worked somewhere along the line but it and, and now i'm sort of thinking oh i wonder if you know if you went through that how fun that would be on the day they turned up for their first day to actually find absolutely out absolutely not what having you've recruited, they look like. who, who, yeah you know, yeah, yeah. Who they absolutely are, what they look like yeah it that was, would be really good fun <laughs> yeah, it was just so. It was just so interesting. Obviously, I'm interested in recruitment anyway. But outside of that, I was just so fascinated and interested that the way the technology's moved, that somebody goes through doing an application form, and and I guess assessments as opposed to in person interviews, or even he didn't even have a Zoom interview. It was just literally going through processes. I guess answering questions automated generated by ai or whatever to the point of going oh yes you're suitable here's a job you can start in a week's time i just found that quite incredible and actually to to think about it to some extent i think that process will probably churn out a better suited candidate than some horrible recruitment processes that absolutely yeah and like you say it could you know there's no doubt that some interviewers will turn away candidates who would potentially be suitable and great at doing that job because they haven't liked them for one reason or another yeah. or something they've done has irritated them or something you know it would take away all of that sort of stuff wouldn't it the, the old school oh that was a weak handshake um, yeah exactly yeah, yeah. no no job for you and then posture and then this and that <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, exactly. It kind of takes away all of that. And obviously you don't as well. You're not impacted by being nervous for the interview or anything like that and not actually performing as you would normally in a day to day job, which is another big thing. Yeah. You don't get the, the elevator pitch or the walk to the interview room and back. No. You don't get the chitter chatter in between. That's quite interesting. Yeah. That's amazing. How have you seen technology impact mm -hmm. recruitment over the years that you have been involved? Oh, like massively. I mean, the first one of the first um, early jobs I had when I was uh, recruiting for a care company, this is probably, I don't know, 16, 17 years ago, they were still relying on local text adverts in local newspapers when they were recruiting for care workers, you know, and adverts in shop windows and things like that. So to get to that point to where we are now in terms of using so you know using platforms like linkedin or facebook or or whatever or job boards it's been a massive shift and i think it, what's really interesting for me as somebody who's passionate about tech is seeing what's next mm. you know i you know i are people starting to use um, tiktok to it i know people are, are using tiktok to advertise jobs and things like that but is there going to point come to a point where candidates can use tiktok and, and things like that to help them find jobs or help search for jobs. I think the biggest thing for me over the last few years I've noticed is video. Mm. So um, there's a lot of kind of, uh, and it's something that we've started sort of using whereby you can you can get candidates or candidates can do it themselves You record a video of them, self introducing themselves, why they're suitable for a job, answering specific questions and actually sending a link to, the, uh, to their video to a job to a company they want to work for so i think people are being encouraged almost like to think outside the box and to try and get away from this oh i'm just going to be one cv of 250 how do i stand out from the crowd yeah, yeah. um so i think video and it's the same when companies are trying to sell themselves to candidates how can they rather than just write a standard job advert you know these are the responsibilities these are the skills that we're looking for. This is a bit of a blurb about us. For me, if I was an in-house recruiter now, I'd be speaking to my marketing team and, and my directors to say, this just isn't good enough anymore. We need to be doing something over and above this, whether it's like a quirky video about what it's like to work here or, or whatever. But you always need to be looking at that next thing because how else do you make your business or as a candidate, how else do you stand out from the masses? I think that's a really sort of important <clears throat> point you've touched on because a lot of the time, most organizations or most managers, when they are recruiting or when they start the recruitment process in terms of actually we've got a requirement, we need to bring on extra staff, whether those staff are permanent, part-time, full-time, full -time, et cetera, or temporary, they don't necessarily think about the fact that they also need to sell their businesses mm. and their working practices to the candidates. Mm. I think some people are of the mindset that, oh, it's up to the candidate to impress me because they want to work for me. But the reality is, especially when you're going for uh, targeting specialists, you need to do as much selling of your organization mm. as they need to uh, prove themselves to you that, they, they, they are the right fit for you as well, isn't it? Absolutely, you know, it's not uncommon for people to have two or three job offers at one time. And I think sometimes, like you say, hiring managers and, 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 and directors of companies have that mindset still that you're lucky if we offer you a job, you know. And, and it's not like that. The market isn't like that. You know, quite often, you know, I've had it before where, you know, one of the best pits about my job is to give that candidate a call and tell them that they've got the job offer. And, and when you get a response back that isn't quite as excited as you are, it's like, oh, okay, you know, because they'll respond by, oh, that's great. I've got two other job offers to choose from, so I'll come back to you in a few days. And you're like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. so, so it is that, it is that. And I think and a lot of companies, this is one of the things that I think a lot of companies don't do well is they don't sell themselves very well. And, you know, they go for that low and ha hanging view of what we've always done. Every time we get a vacancy, we we were a look for a like for like replacement. 
this is where we're going to put our adverts and sort of hope for the best. And if they sort of put a bit more time and effort into it, in terms of how they can get in front of their right target audience, how they can word things differently to, to reach people who aren't searching for that job title necessarily, or how they can use their branding or their messaging or their values to actually give them a bit of an advantage over other businesses is something that any business can use, but I don't think many businesses do it well. Okay. Yeah, so how can someone like you, as in Talent Seeker, and yourself and your organisation, how do you work with organisation? How do you add value to make sure that they stand out and actually manage to attract the best talent for possible for that role? I think it goes... I think it you have to go right back to the beginning. And as I said, I, what I try and do, and what we try and do as a business, is act to our clients as if we are their in-house recruiter. So for example, somebody will come to me and go, okay, we our marketing manager's just handed in their notice. Can you find us a replacement? So I'll be having that initial conversation with, actually is a direct replacement the right thing to do? Let's have a look at your marketing performance over the last year. Let's have a look at the structure of the team. Is there any particular skills that you you have a shortage of? Maybe on the digital side, maybe on the paid media side, maybe on the social media side. Would you be better <clears throat> looking for somebody who's a bit more specialist? Because I've had it before where a company's spent hundred, you know, over £100,000, £200,000 on something like graphic design, well, they could just recruit an in-house graphic designer for 30 grand and save 70 grand. You know, so getting them in that mindset of actually thinking about where's their budget best used within their team and is a direct replacement necessarily the right thing. That's the first thing. The second thing is obviously if they've decided that it's actually is the job to spec up to date, is the advert engaging, Does it is it going to attract the right type of people in, you know, if, they, if that's what they choose, if they want to advertise jobs, that's, you know, that's, there's different steps that they need to go through to make sure their, their advert's going to get into the right place, where are they advertising. If they decide to, to come through somebody like myself, then what I'll do is I'll probably go and I'll probably go and spend some, a few hours with it with them in their office to get a feel for what it's like to work there, the setup, um, the park, you know, everything that a candidate might ask me when I speak to them about the company, what's the team like, what's the culture like, what's the office like. What's my boss going to be like? All of those sort of things that aren't on an advert or description. Then I'll, I'll, I'll sort of take all of that on board. I'll get a really good understanding of the types of people who do well in the business, the types of people who perhaps struggle, what sort of uh, drivers, what sort of values are they looking for? So everything that they can tell me, because they know their business inside out, that isn't on a job advert or isn't on the job descriptions, all those extra things. Obviously, get an understanding of the salary range, full-time, part-time hours. Is there any wiggle room? Would they consider somebody, if I find, found, say, for example, the salary was 40K, if I found the ideal candidate for 45, would they still consider them? Would they consider potentially going somebody more senior, but actually reduce their hours so they still fall within budget? All those sort of those extra pieces of information that you wouldn't just get from a standard recruiter who goes, send me the advert, I'll whack it out on loads of job boards and I'll send you the CVs. Once I've got all of that information, I'll go there and go and find out then, I'll do my targeted headhunting searches using LinkedIn Recruiter, which gives you access to every single person on LinkedIn, whether you're connected or not. I'll then filter it down to a short list. I'll then do the sort of first stage video call or telephone call. And I will only put probably a maximum of three candidates forward to that client but i will be confident that all three of those candidates have matched everything that they're looking for and would be probably stronger than the candidates that they would find themselves you know i so in a, in, a, in a snapshot i say i'll find you the candidates that you want that your job adverts won't find okay. because a lot of the sorry a lot of the people that i'm finding are on job ad, they're not looking for jobs I was going to, yeah, I was going to ask you exactly mm -hmm. that because again, you've used head hunting. I think sometimes we assume that people know what we mean by certain terminology because it's our bread and butter and we do it, etc. So for someone listening who is thinking, actually, that's quite an interesting approach to recruitment. 
And it will save me a lot of time because you're giving me three candidates to look at who you've pre-screened and I'm not sad they're going spending my day on top of my day job looking through 50 CVs. Three CVs with some annotated background information would save me an awful lot of time compared to even if I'm spending 10 minutes on 50 CVs. That's an awful lot of time for, for me as a recruiting manager. So what is for people, bless me. Yeah, so for me, I mean, I've just mentioned LinkedIn there, but there's obviously lots of other places that you can find people. So for me, headhunting is going to be being very targeted in your thought process and where you're going to look for these people and to go and really entice these people who aren't in that mindset of looking for a job. But the key thing is they're open to having a look at an opportunity that if it's delivered in the right way at the right time, will pique their interest enough that they at least want to take a look at it. Okay, so you're almost dangling a bit of your carrot saying, got this great opportunity, it looks a great match for your background, would you be open to having a look? And most of us are curious by nature, and most of us will take a look. That's the first step. The next step then is, sorry, the first step is finding where their ideal audience is. Their ideal audience might not be on LinkedIn. Their ideal audience might be on Facebook or their ideal audience might be members of HR independence or members of CIPD or members of marketing groups. You've got to, the first thing you've got to do is find out what the ideal candidate profile looks like. The second thing is where are those ideal candidates hanging out? Where can I engage with them? Where can I get an opportunity in front of them? So there's lots of sort of different steps that you go through. But for me, it's targeting what they call passive talents. That's people who are open to having a look, but aren't actually actively looking. They're not on job boards. They're not, they're not hating their job. They're quite happy. But if you, as I said, if it's about establishing where they are, where those people are, and then being quite clever in your kind of approach to get them to a point of, where they wouldn't even consider a new job to a point where you've got them so warmed up and so interested that, you know, their main thing that they want is this new job that you put in front of them. So it's taking them on a, on a journey, really, I guess, to from not even knowing about something to the point where actually they're absolutely the ideal candidate for that particular organisation and sending them over. I find that fascinating. Sorry, I was going to say, I just find it completely fascinating that most recruitment happens with people who aren't actually job hunting. I just think it's so funny. You know, we yeah. talk a lot about recruitment and the open market and placing adverts, things like that, but actually a lot of recruitment happens with people that aren't job hunting. Yeah, and I think for most senior roles, for example, because sometimes the organisation recruiting doesn't necessarily want it to be in the public domain, that they are recruiting either, and also the ability to approach passive job seekers. One of probably the key reasons why organizations engaging with someone like yourself would really sort of see the benefit in terms of you can go out there, tap on people's shoulders, initiate and facilitate that conversation in a way to make the whole process happen without necessarily putting it in the public domain that this is what we are doing. And for most, especially senior roles, I think that is how recruitment typically happens. And yeah, I think it's quite a common practice, like I say, particularly with C-suite or director level roles, a lot of the a lot of the searching or, or a lot of the companies want you to work in a very confidential manner. So, for example, with us, because we have we don't advertise jobs, companies can come to us and go, actually, can you look for this profile, this type of role, and we can get them CVs without anybody even knowing that they're looking for a job. And I think the other thing is a lot of companies can be quite nervous about putting salaries out in the public domain because, you know, it can open up cans of worms in, in terms of, other employees who see that advert thing feeling like they're underpaid, you know, and it can obviously create more HR issues as well. So I think there, there's, there, there's several advantages of companies going through something like me 
doing through doing it in the background confidentially where they can poten- potentially get to a point that would have maybe taken them two or three months to get to probably within a few weeks where they've got some ideal people lined up if there's a situation where an employee is going to be maybe another employee in that business is going to be, be dismissed or maybe redundant or whatever but it, it's not known to the organization or it's not known in the public domain so that's I guess that's another value add is that you can work discreetly in the background so that companies are have a, a sort of contingency plan in place if something happens or someone leaves for whatever reason. And I think you're often open as well, aren't you, to candidates that are sort of discreetly looking as well? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. It, it works way. both ways, doesn't it? It works both ways. And I think this is and sometimes I think candidates don't necessarily understand the value that using an external recruiter can give them you know in terms you know I've had it before where candidates you know say well we're applying for loads of jobs doing everything online not hearing anything but actually by working with a recruiter who's already got a very good relationship with that hiring manager of that business they want to work at you know, pretty much if I say to one of my clients, I really highly recommend you see this person, even if they thought the CV wasn't that great, they'd probably see that person because they know I, I, it's my reputation on the line, so I'm not going to put them forward unless I'm confident they're suitable. Mm-hmm. So I think that's where, again, external recruiters, especially if you're a specialist in a certain area, can really accelerate and improve the opportunities of candidates getting in front of hiring managers. Mm. Interesting, isn't it? So what's the key focus, do you think, for businesses sort of thinking about recruitment and, you know, sort of next steps? What are your top tips for sort of thinking around recruitment and taking that step to work with an organisation like Talent Seeker? Yeah, I think with I think a lot of it comes down to budget. You know, a lot of a lot of companies don't necessarily have the budget to work with an external recruiter. And you know, as a former in-house recruiter, I completely understand that, and I understand the pressures put on internally, whether it's the in-house recruiter or a HR team or the hiring manager to not use external recruiters. So I, I totally get that. But I just think for me, it's about work doing that work at the beginning stage is. You know, when you get a vacancy, it's making sure that your job advert is written in a way that is going to attract the right audience. You know, if you choose to advertise jobs, it, and it's putting the adverts in the right places. Don't just, oh, whack it on Indeed and hope for the best. You know, if it's a specialist role, maybe look at other specialist websites where they're more likely to have the audience on that that their role is going to appeal to try and reduce the number of, of, of unsuitable applications. Thinking about the process, so thinking about how we're going to give our candidates a good experience once they're going through the interview process. I always think it's that preparation and that planning at the beginning that will ultimately give that company the best chance of having a positive outcome at the end. Mm-hmm. So just putting a bit more thought and effort into everything whether it's the advert, the job description, the interview process, um, the onboarding once once they found somebody, I think that's that's and and maximizing the values that they do offer. So if they do have flexible working, if they do have a great brand, if they do have you know a nice employee engagement kind of um, package, low turnover. Businesses have to play to the strengths that they can give when they can't compete on other things. So that is probably the biggest tip I would say to companies is look at what's great about working here and how can we get that across to people who don't know about us. It sounds like actually, I mean, you you talked about the cost and not not all organisations can can afford it, which I completely understand. But it sounds like actually there's a a very good trade-off for the money spent. Um, because actually what you do is deliver a far better candidate experience and employer experience in terms of onboarding and actually take a huge amount of work away from the, you know, the recruiting manager. Well, yeah, I think uh, to me, I see my biggest value as time, as the same time, you know, as I said, so it can be quite daunting for a business when they're trying to recruit. You know, they don't want to be dealing with loads of calls from different recruitment agencies, applicants, looking at loads of CVs, getting back to everybody. It is massively time consuming. 
So to me, I take all of that away from the, from the clients that we work with. And at the end of the day, all they've done is spend a bit of time with me to get so that I understand exactly who they want, what the role is, obviously understanding the organisation more if they're a new client to me. I take, they've got to do that. And then they've got to just leave me to it for a week or two weeks or however long. And normally sort of two or three weeks, I would say, to then get in the point where they've got three, three or four, probably three, maybe two, really good candidates that, you know, at the point ready for, ready for a second interview. So all of that time, all of that hassle is taken away from them. And actually, because I work on a contingency basis, they only actually pay me if they take somebody on. So all of that stuff in a way is done for free unless they actually hire somebody. So when I'm sort of sort of going out to new clients, I say, well, it's a bit of a no-brainer, really, because you're not actually going to pay me anything unless I find you your ideal candidate. Yeah, but then also you're confident that you can find that, which is really good. That oh, is yeah, absolutely, yeah, actually. I was going to say that's unusual for a headhunting service mm-hmm. because it is. typically they go within third, there's mm-hmm. only a third up front, a third when the candidate is in front of you and once they actually start, you pay me the remaining. So to be able to say, look, I'm giving you a headhunting services, but when fee-wise on a contingency basis is amazing and probably speaks to your credit in terms of the confidence that you would have in finding them the right candidates as well. And this is a perfect example of how every business can offer has has some advantages. You know, I'm a, I'm a much smaller business than, say, you know, large London, long-established executive headhunting firms. So how can I compete with them? How I compete with them is I can offer a contingency service for the same level of service delivery in terms of the headhunting, but they're not going to be paying me 10 grand up front. They're not going to be paying me, you know, 10, 15,000 pounds before they've even got a candidate. So again, it's using, going back to what I said earlier, that businesses, particularly smaller businesses, have to find a way of how can we compete with those established businesses with huge budgets and still get to work with some fantastic clients. And that's worked well with me. You know, I've done a lot of recruitment for the RNIB charity and I've done it on that headhunting contingency basis. And if I hadn't have done that, offered that, perhaps I would have never got in front of a big client like that. Do you know what I mean? So, and this is what companies, recruiters can do. It's looking for those ways of how we can offer a level of service up here but actually a cost down here. And that's one way that we can persuade companies to give us a chance in that first instance until we've kind of proven ourselves. Yeah, and I'm just slightly intrigued. As I say, we did talk about the previous podcast we recorded, which was about niching. So what led you, is it your HR background to, that, that sort of led you to focus really on you know, HR and marketing recruitment? Yeah, I think I just looked a few years ago, I kind of looked back at all the recruitment that I'd done over the years. Obviously, because I have got a bit of a bit of a HR background and I always naturally get on very well with HR people and I understand a lot of the pressures around that HR people find themselves in. That that's that's what I've obviously niched in HR. With marketing, I've looked at I've built a lot of marketing teams over the years. I've worked as an in-house recruiter. Um, and I've always had a real passion for marketing and technology. And I think if I didn't do recruitment, I would have done marketing. Sometimes I kind of wish I had. I just love the way marketing evolves and is constantly changing with or without technology. And, and, and a lot of the most successful placements I've made over the years have been in marketing. So it's that thing, isn't it? When you have your own business, you get to kind of focus on what you enjoy and what you're passionate about, what you believe that you're the strongest at. And for me, it's marketing, recruitment, HR, you know, and senior level execs is where I think my skills are best utilised and it's where I can add the, add the most value to organisations. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for joining us today and talking us through all of that. It sounds really great. And I just love the idea that actually it goes back to all traditional values around putting the right people in front of the right roles. 
Um, I think so ultimately yeah. it's a match, it's an act making, so yeah. isn't it? You know, but I think there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes to get to that ideal match. You know, for me, the absolute perfect situation, and I had it a few times, is where I've put two or three candidates forward for one role, and the client's been so impressed they've actually taken more than one of them on, and they've always found an extra. You know, it was a recent one I had last year was um, we were recruiting a digital marketing manager for for a company um, and a clothing apparel company and they liked two of the candidates so much that they create they recruited one as a digital marketing manager and then one as another role within that marketing team at the same level which was a brand new role they created for them Mm -hmm. you know for me that is the perfect situation where they almost can't decide so okay we'll we'll give two of them a job amazing (laughs) Absolutely brilliant, isn't it? Because that shows you've absolutely met the brief. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the thing is as well, as I said, I won't put people forward if I don't think they've got a very good chance of being offered the job. Because why would I? I don't want to waste the candidate's time. I don't want to waste the client's time because that's what they're paying me for. Um, so if I keep that in the back of my mind the whole time when I'm recruiting, it means I've got full confidence in everybody that I put forward okay so thank you very much for your time today very much appreciated for those of you that are joining us on the 27th of september 2024 for the hr independence conference matt is going to be sponsoring the event and matt is going to be there so people can come and meet you yeah i'm actually i'm really excited to come along to the event really happy that to be working with hr independence and be sponsoring the event and um, yeah, looking forward to meeting lots of your members there. Yeah, really good stuff. So uh, we're looking forward to that. It's getting very exciting now. We're getting very close. OK, so for all our listeners, once again, thank you very much for listening and for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed this session and obviously look out for future sessions coming up. And if you haven't booked your conference ticket for the 27th of September 2024 yet then why not please crack on and get that organized that's all on the uh, hr independence website we would love to see you there and obviously there'll be matt and other sponsors and other um professionals in the people and independent space that you can come and meet and talk to so we'd love to see you if you would like to get in touch with us and have any comments about the podcast or you'd like to come on the podcast and be a guest then please just get in contact with us at hrvoices at hrindependence.co.uk so thanks very much and we'll see you next time bye thank you bye thanks we hope you enjoyed this episode of hr voices if you have a topic you'd like us to cover or would like to be a guest we'd love to hear from you Connect with us on social media or email us at hrvoices at hrindependence.co.uk. Tune in next time.